This just in. All right, so let's have a look see at what Santa Claus just dropped off. main thing happening here is that I wanted to order the right crystal for the VDP complementary packing materials okay let's see here aha cool stuff inside what do we got Flash memory. This is a uh, memory that is good for uh, booting up FPGAs. Uh, HDMI connector. I was going to try and see if I can generate an HDMI signal at some point. Some voltage regulators. What do we got here? It's a 20 megahertz oscillator for an FPGA project. What do we got here? More voltage regulators. I'm buying a lot of voltage regulators today. Uh, Z8 uh, S180. I am hoping to uh, see if I can build a board that runs at 20 megahertz with one of these Z8 S180 chips. It's got a built-in MMU and some other stuff all on one chip, which I think would be kind of cool. We'll see if that is in our future. Another HDMI connector of some kind. For playing around to see if I can get a, a, a decent form factor there. What's an RP2040? Oh, uh, yeah, these are only a dollar a piece. So I bought a bunch of these, you know, Pi Pico arm chips, uh, which, you know, I don't know, I'll play around with those at some point. You know, before they run out of stock, <laughs> I thought I would get some. Uh, some USB 2 connectors. These are USB C variety, all right? Now, I think that. Uh, these are uh, such that I should be able to get them surface mounted on there. And then I can use a USB-C connector instead of the other kind, the older ones, the mini B connectors, because these are rated for higher power. At some point, I might try to do that. Here's an oscillator that runs at 10 megahertz. These are some resistor pack, you know, multiple resistors on a surface mount uh, package. I think these are four resistors per package here i'm going to use those if i decide i want to try and generate a, a vga video these are part of a you know a, a, a digital to analog converter design that i thought i would try out at some point down the road if we ever get our video project on the road on the bottom of the pile is a 10.7386 blah 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 crystal which is exactly what we need if we want to generate NTSC video coming out of the Texas Instruments TI-9118. Now, the main goal of the day here is to figure out if the chips that I got from eBay actually work and have some resemblance of doing what I think it's supposed to do, which is this 9918 right here. So let's look at the pinout of this thing real quick. Now, I haven't read the whole manual. I haven't worked out how everything's going to go. I just want to make sure that the chips have, you know, passed a smoke test uh, before I spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to make it go. So today, the goal is, can I actually power this thing up and see video coming out of this pin here? Because if you, I've, I've skimmed over the manual enough to know that when you reset this, got a reset input here, it basically tells you that there's eight configuration registers in here, and each one controls this, that, or the other thing. And, you know, things like what's the foreground and background color, what mode of graphics, you know, how many pixels the screen has, that sort of thing. But when it's reset, it gives you a standard set of values. So I'm thinking, if I just put power on here and connect up the crystal the way it's supposed to go, and I reset it, maybe I'll get something coming out of the video output here. I mean, it stands to reason, again, if you flip through this and look at the eight configuration registers, it does tell you when reset, this defaults to X and this defaults to Y and so on. And nowhere does it say anything about it not becoming, you know, active in some way. 
Now, to that end, somebody did post a note. This is like all the comments I get on my channel at one big page. Uh, the early MSX used these. Thank you very much. Somebody was willing to offer me a, a manual, which is, you know, that'd be fantastic. But I think, well, <laughs> let's see how far I can get without it. <laughs> my point is, I think I have um, enough of this stuff online. I did find a few uh, uh, documents. I was just showing one uh, that I found that had the pinout, for example, in it. So I think I got what I need, but I don't really know for sure. Blah, blah, blah. Somebody's recovering from COVID. Uh, I first read this comment, and I thought he was going to say, and this video made me want to uh, wish I never recovered. <laughs> A really nice comment. Thank you very much. Uh, he binge-watched some of my videos. Uh, while feeling a bit below the weather here. Applying this to the breadboard worked fine. Of course, there's a lot of noise output. That's exactly what I want to try happening here. So, yes, I'm looking forward to doing the same today. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Somebody's talking about um, Risk Five. I got some videos on how that works. And what do we got? He wants to do standalone. That's not the one I'm thinking about. Commander X16. Has an FPGA video processor. Yeah, the, the 8 bit guy's been doing uh, a lot of really neat stuff. Uh, building a very Commodore like machine called the Commander X16. You uh, learn more about that. Go ahead and Google it out. He's a, a big YouTube guy in the 8 bit micro arena. Really big Commodore guy. Uh, somebody talking about weight states, which we're going to have to worry about probably at some point. Come on, where's the comment I'm looking for? Somewhere in here, and I want to call out, the, here we go, here we go. I've did this with this, uh, for 6502, bodges, the power consumption is not great, so it's probably going to run a little warm, that's fine. And he had a delay uh, during write to it at 2 megahertz. So uh, we'll get there soon enough. We can't just spew data into this thing is the point. Uh, you've got to pace yourself because it can only go so fast. And what I wanted to do is right here, I want to generate clean NTSC if I can. And without any RAM. And I have a 6 megahertz crystal. We'll look at that in a minute. And then we'll plug in the correct one. <laughs> uh, something about manuals. Looks like fun. Eventually in here. I can't believe how hard it is to find this. Somewhere in here, someone posted a note. All right, here, finally found it. Pebbles over here. So he's, as mentioned previously, you'll need to write the VDP configuration register to get the output signal. Otherwise, what you get looks like a highly attenuated video signal. Once enabled, you should get the proper NTSC signal, which is exactly what I saw when I first plugged this thing in. And it freaked me out like maybe my chip wasn't working. So anyway, uh, thank you very much, Pebbles. Let's make sure that we uh, test this thing correctly. I'll show you what I'm doing here. So what are we going to do? I didn't have the crystal until literally just now. I just opened up the box. Thank you very much. I fired this thing up, running it at about, what, 54% of the speed it should be running at. I figured you never know. Maybe it'll do something. You know, some chips cannot function if you don't give them the, the designed frequency within some percent. Uh, this chip does seem to go, even with a 6 megahertz crystal in here. However, <laughs> the video frequencies are completely insane. So let's go to the bench, and I'll show you what I've been playing around with. All right, so here's the chip, okay? And here's pin one over here. If you can't see the notch, there's the pin one orientation notch, okay? There's my crystal. This is the 6 megahertz that I had sitting around. Let me boot this one up first, and I'll show you what I've been playing around with. And then we can discover whether or not it's working correctly with the right one. Uh, here's the chip pin out again in the same orientation as it's sitting on the, the breadboard here. Okay, so uh, if you're not already aware, the RAS, CAS, and the AD lines, and the RW, these all go to the DRAM chips that would hold all the video memory. And the RD0 through RD7 over here also, this is the data bus that would go to the DRAMs, all right? So all these pins here and all these here, I'm going to ignore. There's nothing on them at all uh, because I didn't feel like hooking up all those wires, <laughs> at least until I know that there's a chance that the thing might work. So what does that really mean? If I don't hook up the video memory, these pins should shatter. We should be able to see that on a scope. 
while it's trying to address the, the chip. And these all floating, it'll probably see all binary ones uh, in there. I probably should put pull-ups or something on here. Eh, I'm going to just leave them float for now. Uh, the C, D, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, these are the data lines that would go to the Z80. These represent the I.O. pins for an I.O. port that we use to talk to this chip. Now, I haven't really gone over all the details of how these things work just yet and how it's going to interface to the retro board, but suffice it to say that this is the data bus that we're going to use to talk to the chip. The um, CSR, CSW, and mode pins, this is essentially the address line that allows us to check, uh, select one of two different um, registers or more accurately, one of two different addresses that this chip would have. And I can read and write by asserting uh, these pins here, okay? And they're active low. There's an interrupt pin, this is an output, that if I enable the chip to do so, it'll generate an input uh, or an interrupt uh, signal every time it draws one video frame. So I can synchronize the code in the, in the retro board to the video screen if I should want to do that. And if we're going to play a game or something, that would certainly be useful. The idea is you could repaint it once every time the uh, screen has been updated. Uh, there's a re uh, reset input here. The external VDP pin, this allows you to, if you want to gen lock to an external video source and overlay on top of it some graphic display, you can. I'm not gonna worry about this, it's gonna just be left. Comvid is our output. N36 is supposed to be an NTSC signal output that according to the manual, you can just plug right into a TV without anything special in spite of the um, schematics that we might see floating around. A lot of people put a, 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 an emitter follower on here to, to lower the impedance coming out of this to increase the drive strength. I'm gonna just hook it up and see what happens. <laughs> just see what goes on. This pin is not used on the 9118. These other versions of the chip allow you to do, do things like come out with Yipper if you want to or, or some other uh, signal, all right? Uh, but if you're going to run NTSC, this pin is not used. CPU clock, uh, I, I think that's an output that gives you a reference frequency from this oscillator. I don't remember. Uh, I'm going to ignore it. And 39 and 40 right here are where you hook up the crystal. Okay, so that's where this crystal is right now. And if you look closely on there, I think you can sort of see there's a, what is this thing? It's like a something s o six o on there this is a six megahertz crystal these are some loading capacitors that are supposed to be in there there's probably so much parasitic capacitance in these breadboards that i don't even need those but i stuck them in there anyway simply because i had them lying around these are 22 puff i think capacitors or 27 somewhere in that ballpark um and uh that's certainly enough uh to get the thing to work and what do we got else we got going on here? So this is a ground pin here, right? So VSS is the main chip system ground here. So uh, after that, you see, I took one of these uh, SIP resistors from the retro board. These are some extra ones. These are 10K pull-ups. So each one of the pins here is pulled up to 10K and they're all common connected to this pin here, which you can see I ran over to BCC. Same thing on the other side to hook up these other data lines here to uh, pull them up to VCC as well, all right? And the idea is if you rummage through the manual, you'll find out that if you assert the right signal, which is what this button here will do, this switch here is connected up to CSW. Mode is high, everything else here is pulled up. All the data pins, everything is high. If the most significant bit on the data bus is a one, when I assert the right signal, it's telling the chip that I want to write into one of these configuration registers. And the value I'm going to write in there is FF because everything's all top pulled up. So when you write into a config register, you, you send two uh, write cycles, all right? So I'm going to hit this twice in order to write a value into a config register in here, which is what the uh, recommendation from Pebbles was on YouTube, okay? And we'll find out in a second they're right. <laughs> this switch over here is a pull-up resistor here, and it's tied over to the reset line here, right next to VCC, which you can see there's the main chip power is connected up to five volts. Switch over here, connected to ground. Okay, so that's all we got going on. This is uh, 
jumper to run in five volts from a USB, uh, which sits on my breadboard here. This is a part of a project I did in my KeyCAD 5 series early on, I don't know, around video eight or nine or something like that, when I actually said, hey, let's do an actual project. Uh, my KeyCAD series is a kind of an introductory thing for people that have never really tried to mess around with PC boards before. Um, it seems reasonably well received. Uh, those people that are uh, already proficient might find it a little long and drawn and <laughs> a little long and drawn out, but that's fine. Uh, find another series that's more focused. That's fine on on advanced features. So uh, anyway, point is, if you dig through that series, you'll see I designed this as an example. So if you want one, you can go grab the Gerbers and stuff like that. And this one, obviously being purple as all get out, uh, came from Osh Park, and it's tiny, so it's like I don't know if it's a six or seven dollars uh for this board including shipping at least in the u.s which i you know you, you can't beat that and these are high grade gold plated boards i can't say enough good stuff about ash park uh it's just that as you get bigger and bigger boards the price starts getting up in in there and if you don't need high quality boards you can use the um imported ones and get a hassle finish and you know the silk screen is not as nice look at how crisp these lines are on this silk screen uh you know the cheapy ones are going to be a little bit lesser quality but if they work what difference does it make right okay so what do we got here i got a, a chip now i'm working on you know getting ready to test it with Pebble's recommendation here. But the first thing that I did when I first powered this up, I didn't have any of the circuitry in here at all. I just hit the power and the ground and the reset button. And the video comes out right over here. So what I did is I hooked up my oscilloscope, the video output pin, which I believe is right there. So it, what do we get? The reset pin, and then I think we skip one, which is the external video input. And then you've got the video output on pin 36, okay? So this wire here goes to my oscilloscope. And this is my oscilloscope ground wire. Always good to use red for ground, right? You know, no, fine. <laughs> I should reverse these colors to a little bit more consistent. But let's have a look, see at the scope when I power this thing up. All right, so at first glance, this does look a lot like NTSC video. However, if we turn on the cursors, what we do here? Let's measure. We can get this thing to synchronize correctly. Stable, there we go. Ah, stable-ish, all right? If we look at how wide this is between what appears to be these sync tips, we get a weird frequency on here. So it says 30 milliseconds, which is 33.22 hertz. So what in TV runs at 33.22 hertz? <laughs> Nothing. However, that's just a smidge over half of what it should be at 60 hertz per field when we're running NTSC. So if I'm at 6 megahertz instead of 10.7, eh, maybe, okay? Now, this does look like it's doing the right thing, but... If we zoom in on it a little bit, look at that signal. I don't know about you, but that's not what the serration pulse is supposed to look like. That weird droop and so I'm like, what the heck is going on here? Well, one of the possibilities is that it just doesn't work, okay? But another one is if this is really supposed to go to a TV, it probably needs to be loaded to 75 ohms or 150, depending on how the whether or not there's supposed to really be a back terminator on here, but according to the schematic drawings, it just simply says video out. So I'm going to assume I can go right into 75 ohms uh, on the video output signal in here. So I'm going to get a 75 ohm resistor and pull that thing to ground and load it the way it's supposed to be. And maybe that has something to do with what's going on here. Now, in spite of what Pebble said, it appears that it is working-ish with a weird signal. He did say it was weird until you reset the thing, all right? Now I'm loading it down to 75. Let's try it again with the right crystal on it and see what happened. Honestly, I'm inclined to just stick it in there with the power on, but <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and power it off just in case. Out with the old 
In with a new. Now, if you're going to do one of these and follow along at home, be careful when you buy your crystal. Uh, that is what we call a parallel resonance uh, crystal. If you go to DigiKey, they have a series and a parallel one, and the chip spec specifically calls for parallel. A parallel resonant uh, crystal are the ones where you have to have these load capacitors on there. And most of the time when you see stuff done, they're always parallel. Um, so, um, and you can tell, again, if you, if you see load capacitors in the design, you uh, probably uh, need to get a parallel uh, resonant crystal. You can also see right in the manual, it does say that the 9X, you know, 18 chips uh, want a parallel resonant crystal, and it, it should have approximately 25 to 30 uh, picofarads of uh, load capacitance. So make sure that you get the right kind, all right? So now we've got the right crystal on there. Let's power it back up. And we can see faster stuff, maybe different stuff happening on the scope here. I don't know if I can get this thing to synchronize. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Please synchronize. I think we got a scope way out here. Mm, come on. I'm going to see a, a ground loop. See the little, well, or some sort of a, a humming on there. Some video noise. Now, I haven't reset it. Let me hit the reset switch. All right, it comes back out. It's doing the same thing. So far, so good. Uh, where do we want to put the trigger here? Eh, it sort of wants to go there. Come on. Okay, Siglent. <laughs> they make the scope here. Uh, let me move the trigger position to the left a little bit. We can get a whole field on the screen. Come on, where do I want to be here? There we go. Uh, let's play with the cursors again and measure the width of a field now. And it's relatively stable. Come on. We're not impressed. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Jeez. Go into normal mode. Maybe that'll help. Actually, it won't. It's doing something else. Standard NTSC sync. Any, maybe I got some different. Well, that did it. Don't know what I just did, but it made it things stable. So here we go. Here's the left one. And there's the right one. And the frequency is 59.8. And I'm just guessing roughly that's the right uh, uh, frequency for the for one whole field of NTSC video. That is very promising. So the crystal obviously is going. Let me move the uh, scope probe over to the uh, crystal output, the CPU clock signal, and see what that's doing while we're in the neighborhood. Never looked at that before. Well, it's going nuts. <laughs> Let's cut the voltage down a little bit. One volt, five volt, half a volt. Here we go. Uh, what do we got coming out of there? I'll bet that's just a square wave running at the... Uh... Now it's still in video sync mode. We need to go back to something useful, <laughs> like leading edge uh, trigger. There we go. Uh, come on. It's trigger level at the limit. There we go. What do we got on a frequency there? It says it's running at 3.58 megahertz. I don't know what that is or why it's running at 3.58 megahertz. Actually, that's the color burst frequency. Now, let's play around with this other switch here. If we watch the scope while I click this, I think it made some differences to me earlier. So if I click it, I'm writing into the VDP configuration registers. And once I clicked it the second time, which, as I said before, it requires two write operations in order to write into a register inside this chip. And what I did based on these pull-ups is I wrote the value FF into configuration register number seven. And when I hit the second click, you'll notice the amplitude on the video signal definitely changed, I believe, for the better. And maybe we can synchronize properly now as well. And yes, we see a vast improvement 
on the scope's ability to synchronize to the signal. It's not even in video mode here. Let's go back into... Oops, I just bumped a knob. You don't want to do that. Okay, Mr. Video, let's go. Click. And get back to when we see the screen. Oh, that is much better because now you can see the top and bottom of the screen. Oh, that's oh, that's vast superior. All right. Now, I was happy with the video signal before. Now I'm uh, ecstatic. That's exactly what it should. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. That's much cleaner. Okay, so... Pebbles, definitely, thank you very much. Otherwise, it would never occur to me to, well, I eventually would have written into it, you know, worked my way up to, okay, add this, okay, add that, okay, hook up all the DRAM, blah, blah, blah. This is running with no DRAM, of course. And uh, what it's doing, if we move the scope probe around and you look at the RAS, CAS, and the address lines, you see it's trying to access the memory that does not exist. And it's basically reading back all floating value, all, all ones. So it's, I don't know if that means it's all going to be a white display or what. And if, as I touch this chip, it is a little on a warm side. That would be interesting to find out. I should have got up to my bench supply and let it cook for a little while and see how many uh, milliamps this thing has taken in because if I want to power it off the retro board, my power budget's already pretty high, especially for the half amp rated um, uh, USB the regular old generic uh, mini B here. Now, of course, I just stick a cable in there and stuff it in a USB-C power supply anyway, and i kind of been ignoring that. This doesn't uh, take a half amp. I've run it with a bench supply before. It's not too bad. The SD card takes a fair amount of power when you're erasing it and writing it and stuff like that. But so far, my power budget it seems to be okay. We should get back to uh, measuring that and making sure that everything is really good. Uh, before we start just adding big chips here that run uh, to my touch, it's noticeably not cold, okay? It's not hot, but it's it's uh, not exactly... Um, it's nowhere near as cool as the Z80. Z80, I have no known sensitive uh, temperature or anything else like that. So what's the takeaway here? This chip is definitely generating what appears to be NTSC video, and it doesn't, it generates it, but it's got like the, it's the, it's a little messed up until you start writing to some of the config registers. And I just arbitrarily chose to pull up and just, yeah, let's just write something uh, by asserting the, um, the, the CSW signal twice and uh, writing some random garbage data into one of the registers, at which point we got the right output. So then how right is this output? I have here two probes that run to a uh, NTSC video capture uh, device that I plugged into the USB port on my PC. Let's go ahead and fire up a... Um, webcam app i'm going to hook up this thing to the ground and to the video output signal which is uh hanging out on this 75 ohm resistor now actually i don't want to have this resistor in here at this time because the uh, video capture device will have a 75 ohm terminator built into it so what i'm going to do is i'm going to just hook it up right here on the end of the wire uh with the scope probe on it now if we look back at the scope at this time we do see the correct amplitude. If I disconnect the probe, the amplitude goes nuts. So loading the output to 75 ohms is part of the game here, all right? All right, now this is like the world's lamest webcam app called Cheese, which runs on my Linux box. I have a white screen here, which may or may not be what I'm supposed to have. Let me reach over and press the reset button to see if it glitches or something like that. It definitely glitched. So this is definitely recording the video from that input. All right, so let's look back at the scope a little bit more closely. When the screen is white, we see this signal here. Let me hit reset. And when the chip is reset, initially, we see this waveform here. Now, that to me looks like black. Let's zoom way in on this here, okay? So what are we looking at here? Um, 
What you see are the, these are the sync tips of an NTSC signal followed by the color burst, which is your three point some odd uh, megahertz burst. It's called the color burst. And then you've got the rest of the signal. Now this is uh, at the same voltage as the color burst, which means it's black. So that makes perfect sense. When I hit the uh, right signal, what you then see is the exact same thing. This doesn't move in any way, but this jumps up here and now we're white. So I suspect what's happening here is I have, by writing into register number seven, told the chip to, I don't know, set the screen to white somehow. Uh, or what it's doing is it's reading a bunch of pixels from non-existent DRAM and it's getting all FFFFFF for all the byte values, which in turn makes the screen uh, be white as well. But nonetheless, this jives with what we're seeing on the video capture app. So I think that this chip is actually working perfectly. All right, so back to the manual here. Here is the PDF I was looking at. Let me show you the cover. Uh, we're looking at whatever this SPPU004 is apparently the document that I'm looking at right here. Video Display Processors Programmer's Guide. All right, and this manual is a little bit different than the one for the 9918. Uh, uh, data sheet. This is kind of a pro, as it says, it's a programmer's guide. Apparently, somebody scanned it from a TI office somewhere. Okay. Um, this manual talks about uh, a little more detail about, you know, how you go about programming the chip and stuff like that. And the value, of course, to me in this particular manual, uh, there's a lot of repeat stuff in here from the data sheet, but this one specifically. Uh, if you look at the dates on here, uh, this was written in, I don't know, 8, 83 or 84, 1984, okay? That means <laughs> it was written after the 9118 came out. And if you look down here, this one is focused on the 9118 and how it works with the newer DRAMs that have uh, four bit data buses on them instead of one bit. So you only have to use two DRAM chips instead of eight. So this is a bit more up to date and relevant to the 9118. So if you're out there Googling around, you're gonna wanna grab this one uh, instead of the old one or in addition to the old one. So this is the, what are we looking at? The SPSS04. This one says the O2, it's the data manual. You should see if we can scrape up all these manuals. It'd probably not be a bad idea. I'm not sure we need to deal with the eval monitor. Dual display, I don't think I care about that. Interface to color monitors for these. These are for the uh, RGB and the YPBPR outputs. So um, this is not the manual I'm looking at right now. And the 9918 is, I think, the manual that's floating around that it's easy to find. Uh, the original one from like 1981 or 1982. So this is, claims to be SPPS02. We go back to the homepage. We're on SPPU004. So there's another manual floating around in here. Maybe that person who suggested they have a hard copy of a manual. Maybe that's the one they have eh, who knows uh anyway yeah it would be nice to scrounge all these up if anybody wants to post some urls in the comments below let me know and uh i wouldn't mind seeing those anyway so let's see what was going on with our white screen all right so uh, there's a lot to go on in here but let's move down to the config registers. I didn't read all of it yet either. <laughs> Maybe we can infer why it went from black to white when I wrote those values. Uh, I'm pausing on this page because in this manual, the example is of the 9118 instead of the 9918. As you can see, we only need two RAM chips. Now, another thing about this manual, if you're gonna work ahead and you're not familiar with TI products, everything is backwards. In other words, A0 is not your least significant bit. A0 is the most significant bit. 
when you're dealing with these TI ASIC chips like this, okay? So uh, when you hook up D0 through D7 to your you know CPU or whatever you're going to work with, flip this around. D7 on the TMS9918 needs to go to D0 on your Z80 and so on. The reason they drew it like this is because this over here is also a TI chip. <laughs> and uh, within themselves, it all matches. And uh, yeah, <laughs> I've wasted time in the past learning this the hard way the first time I ever used a TI chip, which was a GPIB interface uh, talker listener chip from like 30 years ago. Yeah, very frustrating experience. <laughs> anyway. Uh, in this manual, they repeatedly point out all over the place uh, in notes, like the one I just paused on there, but it was another one. Uh, this is a different note. Blah, blah, blah. Writing to the registers. Uh, we'll, we'll find it as we go. There's notes in here that say, FYI, <laughs> keep track of the fact that, you know, A0 and D0 are the most significant bits on uh, this chip, and uh, just keep that in mind. Look closely and, and pay attention to that, because this is, like, not the majority of the manuals I've ever read, okay? <laughs> so this one appears to me to be backwards and can be very confusing. So uh, let's look at our mode and what we were doing there, right? So I hooked up that switch. I have a pull-up resistor on the mode, pull-up on the CSR, pull-up on the CSW. So I'm in, like, 111, and when I click the button, which is what I did, I was making CSW go to zero while these other ones stayed as a one. So that's writing but not reading, which is nice and normal, <laughs> the right way to do it. The key is mode is one, which means I wrote to a VDP register. Now, if you scroll down, what does it mean to write to a VDP register? It says it has eight write-only registers and one read-only status register. The write-only registers contain information controls operation of the VDP, blah, 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 blah. And the way this works is you're going to write a pair of bytes. So it says uh, write-only register is loaded using two data transfers from the CPU, okay? So the first byte written is the data. So when I click the, uh, the CSW switch the first time, that's me sending the data into the, into the VDP, and, 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 and it will stage it until I click the second write, which is the... Uh, time when I offer the VDP the register number that I want it to store that first byte into. So what I did is I wrote an FF in the data write phase, byte number one, and notice it says MSB D0. So this is another one of the times when it's in your face. So again, if you're going to deal with this on your own, <laughs> and this is your first TI experience, they're backwards. <laughs> I can't stress that enough. Don't waste a week of your life trying to figure out why you have garbage values in your registers. It's all backwards. All right, I'll stop harping that point <laughs> this time. Okay, so what did I do? I wrote an FF into here. And FF is FF whether it's forward or backwards, so that's convenient, okay? Then it says the second byte... The most significant bit must be a one. And because I wrote all ones, it is. It also says uh, uh, the next four bits must be zero. And of course, they're not in my case. And then the lowest three bits are the register number that I want to store the value into. So I argued that I have a one here. I got three ones over there. What I really did is wrote into register seven, but I illegally had all ones in here as well. Maybe I could have pulled these down instead of up or tie them down, or I don't know. If you read uh, along a little bit further in the manual, what happens is it says that these are ignored and considered reserved and that you should write zeros in here so that you're compatible with future chips. So I suspect that it's not too big of a deal that I happen to write a bunch of ones in here. We can play around and do some tests later when we actually get a CPU in here, and we can write different values in there and see if it really makes a difference. What I want to do right now is understand why it went from black to white. So uh, if you do go down here and you read about each one of the registers, like I said earlier, it does say, you know, when it boots up, the uh, the default value when you're when you're updating these seven registers is X, Y, and Z, and so on. And to me, that suggested that it should just be running, and it sort of is. But it looked weird. 
And now I remember it was probably weird because I did not have a 75 ohm load on the video until I put that resistor in there or I plugged it into an actual, uh, you know, a composite video and TSC capture device. Okay. Uh, writing and reading the memory. We don't care. What we want to do is we want to write and look at the register. So there's a series of pages in here that says, okay, write only registers. So register zero, which we didn't do. It says it has these registers, and it says uh, the other mode is this, graphics mode, graphics mode, text mode, M3 EXT video. And I didn't do this at all, so it should be whatever the default is. And I thought in here it said on a reset it does such and so. Uh, here's your another note. Bit zero is the most significant bit. Seven is the least significant bit. I'll bet they had thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of customers that couldn't get their products to work because this note appears many places in this manual. If it just appeared once in their GPIB talker listener manual, I would have been a much happier camper. <laughs> I'm just saying. Of course, it's been 30 years. Maybe it's in there. And I was uh, playing the TLDR game and uh, uh, may have not noticed it. I don't know. In any event, uh, what does it say? Zero and one contain the bits to do this. Two and six contain videos for some other stuff. Blah, blah, blah. Register seven contains the color of the text when you're in text mode, and it contains the backdrop color for all modes. So I may have set the backdrop color to white is what happened when I was writing to register seven. And some of the registers, not all 8 bits are used. Here we go. To ensure software compatibility in the next generation, I always put zero into the unused bits. Of course, this refers to the values in the registers, not necessarily the value that goes in. Oh, I don't want to scroll all the way back up there. As you saw earlier in the pair of write uh, operations that take place. So again, I'm breaking some of the rules. Let's see if we can rationalize this thing out. When this thing turns on, I guess it doesn't say what mode this is in. Did it say they're all set to zero or something like that? No, it does not. So I don't know what this is uh, doing, what the default values are. Uh, we can say whether we're using 4K or 16K RAMs. And, you know, what modes we want the sprites to be in, stuff like that. Turn on the video interrupts, turn it off. Okay, register two. These have to do with setting addresses and stuff like that, which memory the, the video RAM is used for what purpose. We'll talk about that some other time when we start writing our code. Uh, what's this thing? Okay, this is the one register I, that I'm pretty sure I'm writing into. The upper four bits contain the color of the bits on in text mode, which is probably the foreground color. And the lower four bits contain the color off bits in the in the text mode, which is going to be your background color. And I said all of it to ones. And, oh, these must be the default bits, 11110000. So if the top four bits is the foreground, the bottom four bits are the background, and I set them all to ones, that's FF, which is white, according to this table here, all right, which is in section 2.3 that we saw earlier. So I set the foreground background to white. That explains why it's white. Now we also know, based on the register select logic down here, we looked at it a minute ago, that we need to put the register number down here in these three bits. We have to have the most significant bit set to one. And I seem to be able to get away with setting these to whatever I want. So if I just tied D4 to ground in the way it's wired right now, I still got all ones for the register number, register 7, right? I still have the most significant bit up here set to 1, but I will choose something other than F for the background color all right so if we open up our video capture again and i tie d4 to zero and click the right button twice we get blue this time well that's handy i can also see this is a little bit noisy 
That must be the ripple we saw earlier. Maybe you couldn't see it as well in the white uh, when the screen was white, but I can see a little bit of hazy little bars in there. That, who knows? I got like no bypass caps and filter caps on the power around the chip, so we can accept a certain amount of noise in this particular version. Now, if I add a 470 microfarad capacitor right across the chip to give myself a little bit of power supply filtering, we can definitely see that the ripple on the video goes away. And if we go back to the video capture device and we even zoom in a little, this is a very clean blue. I don't see any bars in here. I don't know how well that uh, look before with the video capture, but I think now it looks perfect. So, smoke test, 100% successful. <laughs> Next time, we'll try to figure out how to connect this up to the Z80. Thanks for watching.